If we investigate the mind in a way that's nuanced and sensitive to these dimensions of embodiment and embeddedness, then I think it enables us to envision possibilities for transformation that we really need. As we enter into the Anthropocene, which is the geological epoch of human activity that actually transforms the planet in profound environmental ways, and we need to find our way through that in some way that's going to make human life viable, I, I don't think that that's going to be possible without a deeper understanding of the mind. Welcome to Mind and Life. I'm Wendy Hasenkamp. This week, I'm speaking with philosopher and author Evan Thompson. As you'll hear, Evan has traveled a very unique path. As a child and teenager in the 1970s, he was homeschooled at an educational and contemplative intentional community that could arguably be the place where the earliest seeds of contemplative science were sown. This upbringing set him on a journey exploring the nature of mind, self, and human experience, which he continues to this day. Evan is also one of the earliest contributors to advancing the dialogue between Buddhism and Western science, emerging from his work with Mind and Life co-founder Francisco Varela. I spoke with Evan over Zoom last winter about many topics in contemplative science, and we cover a lot of ground. You can think of this conversation in two parts. The first 30 minutes or so is more historical, and we discuss Evan's own path and the beginnings of the conversation between Buddhism and science why philosophy matters in these dialogues, and the project of neurophenomenology in the integration of first and third person methods in studying the mind. In the remaining hour, we talk about Evan's current perspectives on the mind and contemplative science, including the problematic idea that the mind exists somehow inside the brain, the view of the mind that's now called 4E cognition, meaning the mind is embodied, embedded, extended, and enacted, We talk about the self as construction versus illusion, whether or not meditation offers a special avenue to reveal the nature of mind, the need for more diverse thought systems and religions to be at the table in contemplative science, and why it's more important than ever in today's troubled world to understand the human mind in nuanced ways. Evan was one of the first people I thought of for this podcast when we started the project, as he's been part of the conversation since the earliest days. He brings what I feel is a really important perspective on all of this work, a critical lens that's both informed by rich history and motivated by our shared future. If you're interested in more of Evan's work, we've added links in the show notes to some of his writings that come up in our discussion. I hope you enjoy the conversation. I think you'll find it really informative. I'm so pleased to be able to share with you Evan Thompson. Well, welcome, Evan Thompson. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for inviting me to talk to you today. I'd love to start by hearing a little bit about your um, upbringing and background and interest in philosophy and the mind. I know you had a pretty unusual childhood and training. Yeah. So I grew up in an alternative uh, institute slash community in the 1970s that was called the Lindisfarne Association, and that my parents, William Irwin Thompson and Gail Thompson, founded. And the background to that was that um, my dad was a, was a university professor, so this would have been you know late 60s, early 70s, and he felt that the kind of learning and teaching that was happening in the university wasn't really addressing the, the needs of where society was and where human transformation had to occur, and that the sort of university ways of organizing things uh, in terms of, you know, departments and silos of research weren't, weren't really addressing the kinds of um, more systemic and, and cross-disciplinary thinking that needed to happen. So he, he quit the university and he quit as a full professor with tenure and, and wow. you know, sort of launched on this adventure <laughs> of creating an alternative institution that in true, you know, 1970s fashion was also run as an intentional community or mm-hmm. commune. Um, and the basic idea of the Lindisfarne Association was to bring together um, scientists and philosophers and artists and ecologists or, or you know, environmental thinkers and, and political activists, um, spiritual teachers, religious teachers, um, especially contemplative teachers, 
all to uh, address the need for human transformation in the you know industrial post industrial age. And so I was homeschooled in this setting from about the age of 11, 10, 11 through 16. And it was located in Long Island in Southampton and then also in New York City. And as a result of this, um, this place in which I grew up, I was exposed to a lot of different thinkers and a lot of different scientists and, and spiritual teachers. Um, and most importantly, the neuroscientist Francisco Varela, who mm. was also a student of Tibetan Buddhism and a practitioner of Tibetan Buddhism, and a sort of pioneer in the whole discussion between Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist practice and, and Western cognitive science um, and science and, more, and contemplative practice more generally. He was uh, someone who I met at a very young age at the Lindisfarne Association. He came uh, to a conference that my father and the anthropologist and systems thinker Gregory Bateson organized mm -hmm. in, I think it was 1977. And then he lived with us as scholar in residence in, in uh, Manhattan, in New York City. So this was in your home? Yeah, so yeah. this was in my home. And as a result, I, I just kind of grew up in conversation with, with him and with other people. And all of the discussions were about, you know, scientific issues and philosophical issues around the nature of the mind and the nature of human transformation. And, and I was, I suppose, just kind of, I don't know, naturally of a philosophical bent or temperament. So these things really interested me even, even when I was quite young. Yeah. And, um, and so that's where it all started for me. Um, I also met Robert Thurman uh, at, at Lindisfarne. Robert Thurman is a Buddhist author and Buddhist translator who's, I'm sure, very well known to many people. He came as a translator for two Tibetan Rinpoches huh. at a conference in 1976. Oh, wow. And um, as a result of meeting him, I eventually went off to go to college. I went to Amherst College, where he was a professor at that time. Uh, in 1979, and I went there because I was interested in, in Asian philosophy and Asian studies and went to study with him and also to study Chinese language and, and history, which is what I was really especially interested in at that point. Mm -hmm. So my undergraduate education was in, um, was in Asian studies and with a heavy emphasis on Buddhist philosophy. Uh, and then that eventually led me into going into graduate school in philosophy. Um, so that was kind of the trajectory at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So if you recall, what did you find so fascinating about, you know, studying the mind or thinking about these philosophical perspectives? I've always been interested in it ever since I was a little kid. And for me, the interest came out of different kinds of experiences that I had. So I've always been, from like the earliest time I can remember, fascinated by dreams and mm. just the kind of experiences that happen in sleep and falling asleep and trying to watch your mind falling asleep. Like as a little kid, I, I remember just trying to sort of like catch the moment when I would fall asleep. And of course, that never worked. Uh, um, you were very early on lucid, like proto lucid dreaming. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know anything about that at that time. Yeah. Like I didn't know anything about the idea that you could actually you know, be aware of the dream while it was happening. But I was, yeah. I, I was very aware of dreams in terms of just yeah. the impact they had on me. And I would always tell them to my parents and, you know, they were, they were just kind of very memorable events for me already when I was really a, a, like a little kid. Um, and then my dad um, taught me to meditate when I was very young. So mm. I would have been like six or seven when oh, he wow. first taught me to meditate. And his background was, um, he, he had been raised Catholic and he, he left the Catholic church when he was a teenager and then kind of explored and tried to find other things and eventually wound up studying yoga and meditation in the, in the tradition of, of Yogananda. So this was in LA where he, where he mm -hmm. grew up. And so he, when I was very little, he taught me a, a very kind of basic breath mantra concentration practice. Mm -hmm. um, and there was something about it that just immediately appealed to me. Um, so that, I think, combined then with this atmosphere in which everybody was talking about things like meditation and um, and the mind and, you know, the nature of, like, life, biological life, um, it all just kind of was this sort of swirling 
um, constellation of things that that just were fascinating to me. Yeah. And it, you know, partly it was the times as well. It was, you know, it was an experimental, eclectic time with a lot of a different pace of life from what we have now. So mm-hmm. obviously, you know, no internet, no cell phone. So there wasn't <laughs> yeah. all of those things and just much more of an open sense of time and uh, a kind of playful exploration of ideas. And uh, there was just something about that that I that always really appealed to me, just watching different ideas and interaction. And, and, and that's something that's just like carried me forward ever since. And so you... Um... You then, you knew Varela, you were saying, uh, even from when you were growing up and he lived with you for some time. And, and then eventually um, you came to work with him. Can you describe a little bit about that work? Yeah. So the way that that happened is, so as I said, I had gotten my undergraduate degree in Asian studies and then decided to go into philosophy for grad school. It was really kind of philosophical issues that were the main thing that I realized were interesting me. And then um, when I was in grad school, I got very interested in cognitive science. And Mm. and this was at the time when cognitive science was kind of exploding as an interdisciplinary field of research. And there was a lot of philosophical discussion of it. So philosophy of mind was really playing a a kind of very strong role in the field. So I was very drawn to that kind of interdisciplinary discussion, and I already was interested in things having to do with the mind. So I started, um, I basically decided, okay, I want to, you know, write my dissertation in this area and work in philosophy of mind, cognitive science. And it was at that point that Varela was beginning a book about Buddhism and cognitive science. So he had been for a number of years a practicing Tibetan Buddhist and um, had been studying Buddhist philosophy while in his professional life, he was an experimental neurobiologist. Mm-hmm. And he was mainly working on, well, he, he worked on a bunch of things, but he was mainly working on issues having to do with vision and visual perception, and then more kind of general theoretical issues about the, the nature of life, biological life. And he had given a series of lectures. They were on Buddhism and cognitive science. Mm. And he had transcripts of these lectures And he wanted to, on the basis of the transcripts, turn them into a book. And so he knew that I had studied with Thurman and that I was interested in Buddhist philosophy. And then he knew that I was now working in cognitive science for my PhD. And we had known each other really well from having lived together. He was like, I always say he was like a combination of of an older brother and an uncle. He was Uh like a very close kind of family friend in that way. So he he had a connection to a foundation in Germany that funded philosophical research. And he said, look, write to them and apply for money to come and work with me for a summer with the transcripts of these talks to help me turn them into a book. And that was the summer of 1986. So I went to Paris. He, uh, he had just moved to Paris from, from Chile to set up his lab there. And so I went to Paris for the summer to work with him in 1986. And basically, to make a long story short, as a result of that, we wound up writing what eventually became the book, The Embodied Mind, together. And that, that book was published in 1991. And that was the first academic book that really explored the relationship between cognitive science and and Buddhist philosophy and Buddhist meditation. Yeah, Um, I was going to ask, it seems like that was the first um, kind of formal proposal of of the merging of these two fields or philosophies. And it's certainly that book has become uh, pretty much the foundational (laughs) text almost of this whole field. Um, it's been extremely influential and still is. I mean, it was recently re, reissued. Yeah, it was reissued in, I think, 2017. Um, and I wrote a new introduction and Eleanor Roche, our third author. So she joined the writing around 1989. Uh, Eleanor Roche had also been working. She's a very influential figure in cognitive psychology and the study of concepts and categorization. And she also had, uh, she was a good friend of, of Varela's and she had also been working on uh, the relationship of cognitive psychology to Buddhism. And so mm-hmm. she joined the writing of that book in 1989 and she wrote a, a new introduction to the to the new new edition that was published a, a couple of years ago, and I wrote a new introduction. Francisco obviously, sadly, wasn't able to do that. Yeah. Um, he died in two thousand one, 
and uh, so the book has an, has another sort of new life, which is which is really nice to see. Yeah, yeah, it's been great. I enjoyed reading the updated perspectives, but it's still such a relevant book, you know, even from t- almost thirty years ago. Which yeah, don't crazy. say that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. Um, was Varela really the first to, you said he had, was giving lectures, you know, well in advance of thinking about writing this book. Was he really the first to bring together the ideas of having Buddhism in conversation with cognitive science, especially since cognitive science was such a new field at that time? I think so. So I think what happened is that uh, there had been an earlier discussion about Buddhism and and Asian philosophies more vaguely and generally in relationship to science that had that had really been you know spurred by the Tao of Physics book mm-hmm. by Fritjof Capra, um, but that was about physics and mm-hmm. it was about it wasn't specifically about Buddhism it was about a number of different ideas in Asian philosophy and it and it was a very kind of popular presentation. Um, I think Francisco though. You know, so his reaction to that was to say, well, you know, physics isn't really the, the most important dialogue partner. It's actually the sciences of the mind. And for him specifically, that meant neuroscience. And he, together with a number of other people at Naropa, through his efforts, brought together other scientists like um, Eleanor Roche and, uh, let's see, the very first actual uh, mind and life dialogue book. Um, the one that's called Gentle Bridges. Mm -hmm. So that's a a book publication of dialogues that took place around 86 or 87, I think. And so it was Francisco and Eleanor Roche, and I forget all the other participants, Uh, Newcomb Greenleaf, I think he was a computer scientist. So there were others, they were very much around Trungpa Rinpoche, Mm -hmm. um, who were scientists, many of whom were also practicing, practicing Buddhists. And that was really where the Buddhism cognitive science conversation got started as well as actually earlier at Lindisfarne, because Francisco, mm-hmm. so he lived with us as scholar in residence at Lindisfarne in New York City in 1978. And he gave a course of lectures in the fall of 1978 on Buddhism and cognitive science, or he would have probably called it Buddhism and the sciences of the mind. I don't mm-hmm. think he used the term cognitive science. And um, I actually have the transcript of, of, of the first lecture he gave. Oh, wow. Uh, that he gave there at Lindisfarne. Uh, is that his, published his, anywhere? It's not published. It's it's actually in his archive that that Amy Cohen Varela has uh-huh. in in their house in uh, Provence, and she sent me. It's actually his typescript, his wow. um, his notes for that talk. Yeah. So that's. I think it's fair to say actually that actually predates the Mind and Life meeting that that became the book Gentle Bridges. So I think it's fair to say that you know both Lindisfarne and Europa with Francisco were where that really started. And so then Varela was obviously also instrumental in founding what is now the Mind and Life Institute. Um, so were, were you involved or around for some of those early meetings? And can you describe kind of the goals yeah. at that time? So I wasn't involved in the early meetings. I first participated in Mind and Life meetings after Francisco died in 2001. There was the first big public meeting, which was the uh, Investigating the Mind meeting at MIT in 2003. Mm -hmm. That was the first Mind and Life event that I participated in. Um, But I I talked a lot with Francisco about his work in setting up uh, the Mind and Life dialogues. And, And so that would have been in the late 80s, I guess, mid to late 80s. He, through worked together with uh, with Joan Halifax Roshi and then also with Adam Engel. They put together the, f- the early Mind and Life dialogues. Um, so the first one was the one that I mentioned that was the book Gentle Bridges. And then I think the second one was the Sleeping, Dreaming, Dying book. Mm-hmm. And um, in Francisco's mind, the way that he always talked about it was to have a uh, a conversation, and it, it was very much um, sparked by you know the Dalai Lama's interest in science. Yeah. And actually, there is one other episode. Maybe I should mention as backstory before I say something about that, which is um, there was a meeting 
it was called Symposium on Consciousness, and it took place in Altbach, Austria, and it was in 19, it was in September 1983, and that's where Francisco first met the Dalai Lama, mm. and I was there for that meeting because my dad was invited to be a speaker as well, and Francisco first met the Dalai Lama at that meeting, and as a result of their um, discussions, they decided they wanted to continue to have dialogues about Buddhism and science. And that's kind of where the mind and life dialogues started from. Okay. And so in his mind, in Francisco's mind, the dialogues were really about two different systems of thought and systems of practice that were concerned with the nature of the mind and its relationship to the world, reality, and how that was manifested in our experience. And for him, it was, it was always a kind of complicated dance or circulation between different systems of knowledge with different values that would overlap in some areas, but would be very different in other areas that were both very developed philosophically in terms of their theories of knowledge, of logic and epistemology. And there was no there was no agenda that he had in mm. in coming to that discussion. It was for the sake of the discussion as a, a meeting point of these two traditions and their concern with with human existence and and human the human mind and human transformation. Mm. Um, and so he was always very. I mean, he was a scientist, but he was a very philosophical scientist, and he was always interested in the kind of underlying epistemology of science, the kind of underlying assumptions that scientists make about um, what scientific knowledge is and how you get scientific knowledge and how you think about science as a practice in relationship to the world. He was very sensitive to those things that, you know, don't show up as things that are, you know, in your, that you explicitly discuss in your, in your methods or your discussion right. section or your introduction, except for maybe exceptional papers. Um, so he was very sensitive to those things, and he wanted to engage in a discussion with another, you could say, system of thought and practice that also was very sophisticated in the way that it reflected on itself and, and reflected on, you know, what knowledge is and what experience is and what change and transformation are. And, th and that was kind of what was at stake for him in the in the discussion. Yeah. Um, I, I think you could also say that for Francisco, what we could call the ethics of knowledge was very important. Mm -hmm. So the idea that um, knowledge isn't, you know, neutral and just kind of arbitrary and objective. It always is motivated in, in various ways by, um, by values, by concerns, by ways that we attend to some things and exclude other things, the whole mm -hmm. kind of underlying ethics of of knowledge in the case of science and then of, and then in the case of of buddhism that was really what was fundamentally important to him as mm. the as the uh the sort of larger question i suppose or motivation as well for the dialogues sounds like almost a very anthropological viewpoint of the way that science works yeah During yeah time. francisco's way of thinking about science was if we wanted to use kind of philosophical jargon it was constructivist in the sense that he thought that science is a human activity that constructs tools and artifacts that manipulate and disclose the world in a certain way that's a function of the tools and artifacts and how they're used. So he didn't think of science as this kind of, you know, just disclosure of how reality is in mm -hmm. itself. He, he saw it as this interactive constructive enterprise. And he also saw it as fundamentally always um, caught up in issues about how we interpret things. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very kind of sophisticated way of thinking about science. It isn't, that isn't the sort of default way that most scientists are taught to think about science. Right. Yeah. It's a really valuable perspective that I feel like you also bring, um, in, in all of your work. Maybe this is a good opportunity for us to explore or maybe give your perspective on philosophy for listeners who may not be as familiar with the work of philosophy, how is it different from the approach that science takes and, you know, what's the value that it brings to the conversation? Yeah. So 
this, I think, was Francisco's idea um, with the Minded Life Dialogues is that there should always be a philosopher present. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the thought there was that, you know, what philosophers do is they keep track of these larger questions about the ethics of knowledge, the, 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 the nature of knowledge, what's at stake in different traditions and interpretative systems engaging with each other at a, at a kind of conceptual philosophical level. And so for Francisco, it was very important that there always be someone who would focus explicitly on that rather than say the job of a scientist, if the scientist is a neurobiologist, is to sort of you know, focus on questions about the nature of you know, the brain and the nervous system and evolution and development, those kind of, if you will, sort of first order questions about how things look when we investigate them through a biological method or lens, that's the job of the biologist or the job of the neurobiologist. The job of the philosopher is to step back and um, bring to light background assumptions and questions and um, issues you could say about meaning. Mm -hmm. what, is, what does it all mean? Um, what are the kinds of assumptions we're making about how knowledge works if we think that uh, experimental manipulation has some kind of primacy um, in, in providing more reliable knowledge than some other approach. So those are the kinds of things that philosophers are especially concerned with. And, and for Francisco, um, those questions were really the deep questions in the, in the dialogue and, and they had to be represented by a voice that was mm -hmm. going to speak directly and explicitly to them. Yeah. And in my own work, I mean, that's kind of how I've always seen a large amount of what I do is, is, is trying to work in that way. Yeah. That's making me think another um, major perspective uh, brought by both Varela and your work is this idea of bringing together the subjective and objective or the um, first person and third person, as is sometimes called, perspectives on um, into scientific inquiry. Yeah. So there again, you know, Francisco was an unusual scientist because, you know, I mentioned that he had this kind of for lack of a better word, sort of constructivist way of thinking about science. But he also had a very phenomenological way of thinking about science. So what I mean by that is phenomenology is, in, in the philosophical sense of the term, is the movement in philosophy um, starting in, say, the 19th century and then really developing through the 20th century of being concerned with understanding the nature of experience or, or lived experience. Mm -hmm. And Francisco saw science as itself based in lived experience, say in the form of observation, for example, and as an elaboration of it, and as needing never to forget that that is its underlying source. And he thought that that was especially important when we turn to investigate the mind scientifically because mm. there's ways that you can uh, bracket certain kinds of considerations about experience if you're you know examining uh, the metabolism of a cell or you're doing you know physics you you may be able to of course you're going to you know acknowledge that science requires observation but you can bracket certain other kinds of questions about the nature of experience but when you turn around to investigate the mind um, and then more especially when you try to investigate consciousness mm -hmm. or, or experience itself, then there's no way you can bracket experience because it's not only what you're trying to study, but it's, it's both your method and your object of study. And so then the question becomes, well, how then should one proceed to do that in a way that's going to be um, precise? And so Francisco was very much inspired by the idea that as cognitive neuroscience develops increasingly sophisticated tools for examining brain activity in relationship to what people say about their experience, the reports that they make, then we need um, increasingly refined and precise ways of understanding what's going on when someone makes a report mm -hmm. about their experience. And that's going to depend on what happens when people make reports generally, but it's also going to depend on the kinds of questions that they're asked that are going to direct their attention in certain ways, the way that they're able to direct their attention, the quality of attentiveness they have, the stability of um, attentive attentiveness. And that's where then the connection, in his mind, the connection to meditation was to be found. Right. So he was actually not interested so much, 
in studying meditation as an object. Mm -hmm. He wasn't interested in, say, a question like, what are the bio-behavioral effects of mindfulness practice on the brain or Mm -hmm. on behavior? I mean, it's not that he would say that that's not a interesting or legitimate question, but it wasn't really the driving question for him. The driving Mm -hmm. question for him was, how can the practices that we see used in meditative contexts or certain meditative traditions that have to do with training attention, how can they be used to make phenomenology more precise in a way that can then feed directly into a collaboration with cognitive neuroscience or cognitive science more generally in the study of consciousness. And so for him, it was really about a a different kind of science of the mind that could be created by weaving together the contemplative training of the mind and the cognitive scientific study of the the mind and the brain and experience cognition. That was for him what was what was really the 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 key idea. And he he used the term neurophenomenology as a name for that. And he saw that as different from questions about, you know, what's the effect of a of an eight-week course of MBSR on measures of attention? Mm-hmm. Or how does that compare with long-term practitioners of meditation? in terms of various measures of attention. Mm -hmm. That wasn't really the question for him. Right. And so, yeah, it seems like the field has, you know, as it has naturally evolved and grown and taken on different directions, it's taken up many more of these questions where it's become about studying meditation itself and the effects of meditation and maybe less so about using meditation as a tool to understand the fundamental substrates of consciousness or yeah i think that i think that's right yeah yeah i don't know whether that's good or bad it's just been interesting to watch the evolution of how it's gone yeah i mean my perspective on that is um i mean it's a complicated topic but i i would say that varela's idea of neurophenomenology was very radical and Mm -hmm. very promising and there are very, very few studies that have been done that really try to pursue things in a neurophenomenological way. Um, there's a few, yeah. um, but most of the studies aren't aren't concerned to do that. Yeah. And I think that's a shame. I think it would be good if there were more studies that tried to do that. <laughs> Let's just say that. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's an inherently challenging thing to try to do as a scientist. Yeah. It's very challenging. Um, yeah. To really try to bring in a subjective perspective in you know in some ways certainly how science is often trained it's almost antithetical to the way you're trained to do science in a quote unquote objective way right um, where you're not allowing these things that could be viewed as less rigorous to enter into the picture but i think it's also important to understand the <laughs> that even what we think of as objective is shot through with um you know as you said kind of experience and phenomenology and and this subjective perspective. So you can't get outside of it. Yeah. I think, I mean, if you look at some of the studies that I would consider to be more neurophenomenological, they're just very demanding in terms of what you have to do. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, you have to work with individual subjects without the same kind of averaging over trials and over subjects because you're interested precisely in the variability of each response in a given subject and then compared to other subjects. And that's just time consuming. Um, And then if you're also trying to work with more detailed uh, verbal reports, I mean, that adds a whole other dimension of- From a qualitative data- Qualitative perspective, perspective, right, exactly. So that adds a whole, you know, other demand. so it's just it's it's extremely demanding and time yeah. consuming. From my perspective, it's not it's not any less rigorous and, and very rigorous mm-hmm. work can be done, but given the you know the demands and pressures of, of uh institutional science, it's just it's right. very hard to do. Right. Well, hopefully I feel like there's the beginning of a shift, um, at least in in neuroscience and hopefully in cognitive science more broadly, to move away from this averaging kind of yeah. methodology and to really embrace the unique individuality of each mind, each brain. Yeah, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to average across brains. And there's some great work being done by Helen Wang to um, try to unpack new methodologies. Right. Yeah, I mean, the averaging is fine 
depending on what your question is, like it's a perfectly, it's a perfectly valid thing to do given a particular question that you yeah. have. But for the neurophenomenological nitty gritty, it doesn't work. Yeah. 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 So you have a new book out called Why I Am Not a Buddhist, <laughs> which uh, I really enjoyed. I think it brings a lot of very important perspectives and critiques on on the dialogue between Buddhism and science and how this field has evolved. Um, so I'd love to talk to you about a couple of the ideas that you bring forward in that book. Um, one of the things that you've talked about for a few years now is this idea of neurocentrism or the emphasis that the field has had on on the brain or the mind being located in the brain which i think many people would assume that that's accurate and you know there's been so much of our culture kind of portrays it that way so can you share uh, your perspective on why that's problematic and what's a better way yeah so this um it it is actually connected to our earlier discussion in that in the book the embodied mind um, one of the central ideas of that book was the idea that cognition is embodied. And what that means is that the body is not a kind of uh, outside accompaniment to cognition, but is actually a necessary part of what makes a process a, a cognitive process. That, for example, perception isn't something that happens inside the head in the sense of the conversion of a of a 2D, you know, inverted retinal image into some internal neuronal representation of an independent outside world, that perception, visual perception, has to do with how the eyes move and the head move and the body moves in a dynamically changing environment where the changes in the environment are being shaped um, in part by the movement of the whole organism mm. in the in the environment. So this this idea is now kind of widely known under the under the banner of embodied cognition, and was one of the central ideas of the embodied mind. And so from that embodied perspective, it's a confusion, a kind of conceptual confusion or category mistake to say that the mind is the brain or the mind is inside the brain. And an analogy that I that I like to use is that it's a bit like saying that. Um, that flight is in the wings of the bird. So mm. the bird needs wings to fly, um, but the flight isn't in the wings. The flight is an activity of the whole animal in relation, in dynamic relationship to the environment. And so, you know, the, what the wings do is they generate lift, which makes flight possible, and flight is this whole animal activity. So similarly, the mind or cognition is not something in the brain, it's something that the brain makes possible for the whole organism or animal or person in dynamic interaction or engagement with, with the world. So when we go inside the brain, especially if we're seduced by sort of, you know, the, the kind of neuroimaging pictures that we see into thinking, oh, this pattern of activation is the mental process. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it just collapses the levels in, in, a, in a confused way instead of realizing, well, this pattern of activation is a necessary part of the whole uh, activity that is the cognitive activity of the, of the person or the, or the animal. Mm. Do you think it's been made worse um, by, you know, since the advent of neuroimaging, we've had these pictures? Yeah. And so it seems like it's that much easier to just reify the idea of the mind into this static image of a brain. I think so. I think it has actually been, let's say, facilitated by yeah. that in that most of us are very visual beings and we love pictures. Um, the pictures are attention grabbing. And I mean, there's, the, there's that aspect of it. There's other aspects that have to do with a lot of the early fMRI methodology and, and still a lot of the fMRI methodology today is based on subtractive thinking. Mm -hmm. So the subtractive method or is, is, a, is a way of thinking where you have cognitive activities that are made up of parts and you can sort of add and subtract the parts in relationship to each other. Like um, one part might be attentional focus and another part might have to do with um, 
some affect or emotion regulation, and then the idea that you can set up tasks where you manipulate these independently and then look at them in terms of their corresponding brain activations and subtract one from the other. This is like a method that's been you know used throughout mm -hmm. the field. And um, of course, if you ask most scientists, they will say, well, it's not really like that. We know that you know these, these things aren't like linear things that add together, that the, the, mm -hmm. that the whole system is probably nonlinear and complex, and it's not, this is just like a, a heuristic. <laughs> um, but it reinforces this idea that you have you know, areas in the brain that correspond to particular cognitive functions, right. and that therefore the you know, fundamental view of the mind is in terms of, you know, differential activation of neural components as viewed through this neuroimaging lens. Uh, it's very seductive and, yeah. and it's easy to forget. It's just a method to get a handle on right. one aspect of something that's way more complicated. Yeah. I think it's another great example of what you were saying about um, the need to be really explicit about the assumptions, right? And I think this is something that gets lost. The scientists understand that this is a you know, a real oversimplification using this methodology. Right. And they understand the complexity and the nuance more of what they're looking at, but that doesn't get translated, you know, when it's in the news. Yeah, it doesn't get translated in the news. And and um, and some scientists are, you know, more sensitive to it right. than others, you know. Right. So it depends, again, I mean, this is a sort of Varela-like theme is that, you know, scientists are individuals too. And there's yeah. a lot of variability. <laughs> like some, you know, are really sensitive to these issues and, and others true. maybe not so much. That's true. And so if it's incorrect then to view the mind as, you know, something located in the brain, well, first, would you say, though, that the brain is a necessary element of, of the mind? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the brain is a necessary element of the human mind, just as, you know, the wings are a necessary element of the, yeah. of the bird for flying. Yeah. So um, it's rather that we shift our thinking about the role that the brain plays. Um, okay. It's not a it's not a container of the mind. It's a it's a facilitator of the mind, and the mind resides at the level of the whole yeah. animal in, engaged in its uh, environment. Yeah, that's helpful. So, um, in addition to you discussed the idea of embodied cognition and how the mind is embodied and kind of fully integrated and dependent on the body of the organism, you've recently talked about a couple of further extensions of this idea, which is referred to as 4E cognition. Mm -hmm. um, so, embodied is one of the E's. Right. So, embodied is one of the E's. Um, embedded, which really goes along with embodied. So, embedded mm -hmm. means that um, the person or the animal is um, enmeshed with the environment and mm -hmm. the environment um, supports and scaffolds a lot of uh, the complexity of, of uh, cognitive processes like, um, like attention um, or perception. And so this is uh, another E term is, is um, you know, this is a kind of ecological perspective, you could say, that it's, mm -hmm. it emphasizes the importance of of the environment, especially uh, in a way that helps to remind us that a lot of what we see going on in, you might say, standard canonical cognitive psychology tasks is very uh, uh, disembedded because it's, you know, it's it, the person is stationary in a dark room with um, a computer screen and they're still embedded. That is an environment, but they're not uh, embedded in a, in a richer way. And so mm -hmm. the idea of embedded cognition is to look at the uh, more, uh, you could say, ecologically uh, valid mm -hmm. uh, context of, of natural cognition, mm -hmm. where natural means not sort of artificially constrained in the lab. Right, right. Yeah. So that's embedded. So then uh, another E, there are lots of E's. <laughs> another E is um, emergent. So this is the idea that um, what we're interested in are systems that are that are complex networks where patterns arise dynamically through the dense interconnections of the elements that um, make up the network. So mm -hmm. those could be, you know, brain networks. They could be um, sensory motor networks. But the basic idea is when you're dealing with complex systems, what you see are patterns of activity that emerge globally that in turn shape and constrain the, the local activities. 
And these kinds of systems are not very well analyzed in terms of the sort of classical idea of mechanism. Mm. The, the classical idea of mechanism is you, you take a system apart into separately identifiable parts and you can specify um, a specific mechanism for each part. And then you put them together and what the system does as a whole is a kind of additive function of those uh, independent mm-hmm. components with their independent functions. Like a car or something. Right, mm-hmm. or a watch or, mm-hmm. you know, uh, a lot of um, computers are, mm-hmm. are still uh, designed this way. And biological systems are, are for the most part, not like that. They're... they're um, dense interconnected networks of heterogeneous elements that generate emergent patterns that can't really be analyzed um, fully through a kind of uh, uh, analytic view where the whole is nothing but the sum of the parts. Mm. So that's the idea of emergence. Um, So the four E's are are then embodied, um, embedded, emergent. And then the fourth is the idea of inaction. And this is another term that we introduced in the embodied mind we, we talked about the inactive view of cognition. And the, the fundamental idea there is that cognition is a kind of sense-making. That is that it enacts or brings forth what is significant or meaningful rather than representing information that's already kind of specified in advance hmm. of what the system is doing. Can you give an example? Uh, so one example would again be um, you could take visual perception, where if we think of visual perception as visually guided activity in the environment, the activity itself determines or ha- or helps to determine um, what is relevant or meaningful to it in terms of what what's salient for attention isn't something that's just given in advance, I mean, there may be some things that you can talk about, you know, different sort of featural saliences like brightness and color, but those things are singled out and are relevant because of the way the system is put together and how it can act in its environment. So the action side of the story is very important for talking about the environment, not as as a kind of neutral place, but as a place that's significant for that kind of being with that kind of um, with that kind of architecture. And so an action really subsumes the other three E's. Um, mm-hmm. The inactive perspective has the idea of embodiment and emergence and embeddedness sort of built into it. It's a way of, in a way, summarizing and synthesizing all mm-hmm. of those three other E's. Mm-hmm. So that's now generally known as the four E cognition perspective in cognitive science. And there, there are a number of different people who work on different aspects of this. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, a, it's sort of a, a movement or subfield, you could say. So I think this view makes a lot of sense. Um, as a scientist, I think about... <laughs> how you could design a study that actually, you know, embraces that holism. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I think it it just gets exponentially more complicated when you try to measure or control or have any um, kind of input from these larger systems, right? And these dynamic, um, dynamic systems and looking at context. And I, you know, I, I take the the nature of the embedded to be kind of social context, physical context, all of these factors, uh, which is certainly, they all influence the way the mind works. But I struggle when I start to think about um, how to really ground that out (laughs) in a research, you know, in a methodology, in a research study. Do you think that there's hope for being able to, to really do that? Or is it kind of beyond what science can do? Uh, I think it can be done, and I think people are doing it. I think um, it's not as if every single experiment has to embody all of these things. Right. It's more in a way a matter of putting together research teams. So Mm -hmm. the idea would be uh, if you're investigating something like, let's say, take attention, Mm -hmm. um, which is already a huge thing in and of itself, Mm -hmm. Um, there are ways of uh, investigating attention that 
are you know sort of more classical and, and restricted to things like um, eye movements and orienting behaviors in a limited lab setting, and, and that's all fine. Um, but if we're interested in, say, attention in a, in, a, in a fuller way, then we also want to um, bring in these other perspectives where we might uh, analyze it from not just a neuronal perspective, but a fuller sensory motor perspective, and where we also see um, attention functioning in natural settings. So we have a, we have a, a, a kind of social ecological uh, aspect that we bring into the study. So it's not just how attention is functioning in the lab, but how it's functioning in, in interactive real world settings. Um, so it, it's a question of bringing together different perspectives and um, not kind of just limiting our view to one of them. In, in, the, in the scientific study of, um, of meditation, I think this is especially important because the tendency has been to investigate let's say focused attention which is mm -hmm. a kind of uh you know term that scientists who study meditation have operationalized to mean a certain thing they mean you know a style of practice where you're trying to stabilize your attention on a particular content or object and then the way that that's usually investigated is through uh looking at different measures of selective attention either behaviorally or neurally when people are let's say maybe focusing on their breath and then they're uh they're going to be distracted and their mind is going to wander and then they're going to bring it back to the breath and so kind of looking at that through behavioral measures and neuroimaging measures so the the problem there is that um attention is in a meditative context it's as much a social practice as it is an internal individual mental regulation practice that mm. is to say that you know people people learn to meditate you know from an instructor in communities um in in different kinds of contexts where they are um monitoring themselves in relationship to others and that whole social context uh could actually be quite important in supporting and structuring what attention is capable of in a way that's just completely missed if you look mm. at it as an individual internal kind of mental regulation process. Um, and, and this has to do, I think the, the sort of excessive focus on the, on the individual measures has to do with a way of thinking about meditation that's very modern and Western, which is it's this individual thing that you do as an individual in your, uh, in your home mm -hmm. or in your office. Um, and and you do it alone and no one and else you do is really it alone involved. And no one's yeah. there. Yeah. And and that's that's like that's how a lot of people do meditation today. But mm -hmm. that's a, that's that's a social fact, right? That's not mm -hmm. a that's not a, a human universal. And so just taking that as if it was the standard and then mm -hmm. examining that and thinking that you're revealing what attention is really about in meditation, I think is really limited. I like this view of bringing in the social aspects of meditation. I think, yeah, for many people that that will be um a little bit of a new idea. Do you think it also, um, I'm thinking almost on the other end of it, is there a flip side where the impacts or, you know, I think we have this view that we're working on ourselves to change our own minds, you know, as individuals, like you said. And I think a lot of the outcomes that have been examined so far have also been very individual based, you know, changes within one, you know, one person's brain or body or, you know, psychology. Do you think that there's also a flip side of kind of um, social consequences or for transforming minds? Is it, you know, equally important to maybe start evaluating um, the effects in a social way as opposed to just the effects on the individual? Yeah. I mean, I think it depends on what our question is and yeah. what, what we're really trying to do. I mean, for, for me, so this is something that's kind of evolved for me over the course of, of being involved with the Mind and Life Institute going back to 2003. And it is something that I think actually marks a difference between, um, certainly between how I think of it now and how Varela would have thought about it in his setting. And, and that is that I, 
I think meditation is as much ritual as anything else. Mm. So um, what, what I mean by that is that um, rituals are, are social practices where you create um, kind of special performative interactions mm-hmm. and they create their own alternative realities or, or as if realities. Things are, things are enacted within a ritual for the sake of the ritual. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that meditation is as much a social ritual practice as it is a kind of internal examine your mind um, or become aware of your mind practice. So, so what, what, what's at issue there for me is this idea that, and, and so here is, you know, I sometimes wish Francisco, you know, were still around. Well, I mean, yeah. I always wish he were still around, but if <laughs> yeah. he were, if he were still around, I would, I would want to have this conversation with him. Yeah. Um, because, because he very, and this shaped neurophenomenology, his idea was very much that when you practice meditation, especially certain kinds of meditation, which for him were, were, were really represented in Buddhism, what you're doing is you're, you're engaging in a kind of sophisticated inner examination or introspective examination and observation mm-hmm. of how the mind is. And I've actually become, I think, quite skeptical about that way of thinking about it. Mm. Um, I think that what happens in meditation is that there is a social, collective, ritualistic practice that definitely changes and transforms people's minds. Mm -hmm. But the idea that it's a kind of inner, you know, telescope or inner microscope, I think um, it it actually, uh, I think, distorts what's what's happening. Mm. It's this idea that you sort of go within and you see how things are, Mm -hmm. but what you're doing when you go within in that way is you internalize a whole ritual performative social context and you internalize a whole conceptual system that you might learn, Mm -hmm. say, at a seven-day Vipassana retreat. You might get a sort of, you know, minimal or baby Theravada system that you Uh sort of internalize and you use to sort of monitor what you're doing, or you might get a Zen one, or Mm -hmm. you might get a Dzogchen one, or, you know, you go on a Mm -hmm. uh, yoga retreat and you get a, you know, you get a yoga one and you internalize these systems in a, in a context where you're practicing with other people in a, in a ritualistic way where the ritual involves, you know, how you enter the room, Um, you know, what kind of religious iconography might or might not be present, the kinds of bells that are used, all of these things where we create these alternative spaces um, and you internalize all of that. And that, and that actually shapes the inner domain as much as it reveals the inner domain. Mm, Right. And when I, so it's in a way, I like to think of it as an inactive view of meditation. So a performative kind of ritual in action and if we look at it that way, then this whole way of talking about in meditation, what you're doing is you're learning to see how the mind really is in the way that a scientist, when he looks through a telescope or microscope, sees how things really are. Mm. That just isn't the right way to think about it anymore. It's a kind of objectification that isn't appropriate. Right. Um, so that, for, that whole way of thinking kind of evolved for me over the years of being involved in mind and life. And I have to say, like what I'm saying is not news to people in religious studies. Like this is, you know, I mean, they, 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 right. they think about it this way. Right. Um, and one of the great things about the Mind and Life Summer Institute is that, you know, it brought together people from religious studies who would look at it this way. And it was through my conversations with them mm-hmm. that, I, that I also started to, to think about it this way. And so the question then for me becomes, um, if we're interested in a kind of reflexive examination of that sort of, I don't want to necessarily say scientific because it isn't just scientific. Let's say reflexive, where we want to engage in some kind of self-examination of that. Then we need perspectives that are the perspective of the historian, the perspective of the anthropologist, Mm -hmm. the perspective of the sort of, you know, ethnographer of science. If we're looking at scientific studies of meditation and how they feed in and out of retreats, for example. Um, And of course we, we need the the cognitive science perspective, Mm -hmm. which helps us see how the, 
the basic mental capacities that we have because of the kinds of creatures we are with the kinds of brains we have, um, how those both make possible these kind of collective rituals and then how they're, they're transformed by the collective rituals as well. Okay. So that's for me kind of where the edge of research is. And, you know, there are some people, some researchers who have this in view as, you know, so like immediately someone like Andreas Rupstorff and mm-hmm. or who leaps to mind as, as, as a researcher who combines anthropology and neuroscience who, yeah. who sees it in this way. Yeah. And, and so that's kind of how I see it now. It's, it's very continuous in a way with Varela's ideas, but the emphasis is somewhat different because he still, yeah. I think, saw meditation as like the special method. And I, right. I don't see it that way anymore. Right. I wonder if his views would have evolved too, you know, oh, along they would the have. same yeah, lines. Certainly. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure. Oh, definitely. It is. It just seems like a natural extension of an action and, and yeah. everything you've been describing. I wonder, um, I'm just going to try to draw a couple links and see if this can make any sense, but some of the researchers and thinkers I've been talking to, we've spoken a lot about um, predictive models of mind that are Mm -hmm. very popular now. And um, so this idea that the mind is a a prediction machine and it, you know, constructs this model of the world based on experience and then kind of um, deploys that model as a a shaping of, um, of information that's coming in, which sounds a lot like um, what you were saying about the inactive approach and kind of meaning making. And have, have you um, thought about that intersection? Yeah. Um, so there, I would say it depends a lot on the nitty gritty details because um, the sort of so-called predictive coding view mm-hmm. of the mind or of the brain um, is very much in vogue now. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a bit faddish. Mm-hmm. And the core idea is actually a very old idea. Yes. And depending on how the idea is articulated, it can either be articulated in, um, a, a, let's say, a representationalist way, which wouldn't be the inactive way. So on the representationalist way, the idea is that you have representations in the brain and um, you, you basically have representations that are, that are functioning to, to generate hypotheses about how the world is. And then the, um, the incoming sensory information is actually an error signal to um, minimize the mismatch mm-hmm. between the internal representation and the outside world. So it's a very kind of um, represent, kind of classical representational mm. story told in this kind of predictive coding way. Mm. That's actually very different from the inactive idea. Okay. Um, because it's, it's still the idea that, um, that cognition is a kind of inferential representational process in the head. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, and it's the idea that what cognition is, is about an internal model in the, in the brain of how the outside world is. Mm-hmm. Um, the idea that, that cognition is motivated and driven by expectations and then um, a constant kind of calibration of behavior and action in relationship to the world that modulates the motivations and expectations, that more kind of dynamic interactive way of telling the Mm -hmm. story, that's more of an, an, an inactive perspective on it. So it's just to say that the kind of predictive mind viewpoint right now and its relationship to an action kind of kind of depends on who's how it's articulated. Mm. Okay. I guess what got me thinking about that is you were talking about ritual and I was thinking about all of those um cultural and behavioral and social elements to a practice seem like they um just serve to further enhance kind of the the conditions and maybe the quote unquote model or whatever it is that you're trying to develop through practice. I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense, but it seems just like other ways to further facilitate the shifting of the model. So coming into a room and making certain postures and sitting in certain ways and the bells and all of the uh, ritual elements kind of brings up already. It, it um, facilitates this, these concepts, these larger associations in the mind that are part of the model that, that then are hopefully associated with the kinds of internal or activities, mental activities that you might want to be engaging in and the kinds of transformation you might want to, to engender. So does that make any sense? Yeah, I, I, I see what you're saying, but I would say that, um, that is still to think about it 
as if the point of the ritual is to get you to be in a certain inner state, mm. um, which might be part of the story, um, but it's to prioritize the inner again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it could be that actually equally important, maybe more important, is the social reality that's being created. Mm. And what's happening on the inside is in service of that. Right. Um, I mean, this this connects. So people who are in religious studies are very familiar with these kinds yeah. of discussion, but it connects to this idea that we've assimilated in the West, basically from Protestantism, which is the idea that what really matters is what you inwardly think and avow and feel. Mm -hmm. And that's the test of the reality of something. Mm -hmm. Whereas from another perspective, you know, um, that might really not be so relevant. What is more relevant is actually the, the social, the, the social performance and the social dynamic that's being created. Um, and I mean, the, of course you can't pull apart the two, There's, right. but we always default to what is happening on the inside. Right. And, and then we think, okay, so if we can show that these, that these rituals really improve emotion regulation or really mm -hmm. improve attention, then that establishes their, their validity. Right. And I just think that's a kind of very one-sided way of looking at it. Yeah, oh, that's really helpful. So another section of your book that I really enjoyed is the chapter on the self. And you give a really great and nuanced exploration of this idea of no self that we often hear about um, in Buddhism and potential relationship to what we're learning in cognitive science. And I think one thing that I um, really appreciated you drawing out that I haven't heard anyone make this distinction before is the idea that the self as an illusion versus the self as a construction. Mm -hmm. So could you kind of unpack that for us? Yeah. So there's there's a, a a very kind of, let's say, popular idea. Um, and by popular, I mean, you know, we hear it in journalism, but we also see it in um, scientific discourse in the world of meditation and science or Buddhism and science, that science in particular, say, neuroscience has shown that the Buddhists are right, that there is no fundamental self. Um, and so the chapter on my book is on self is basically arguing that that's a kind of misguided and inaccurate way of, of looking at things for a number of different reasons, um, some having to do with Buddhism and some having to do with science. So the uh, idea is that when people say that there is no self, and they're speaking, say, out of a point of view of neuroscience, what they usually mean is something like, um, there, there is no self that can be found inside the brain. The um, self is an illusion created by the workings of the brain. And what they mean by self is an independent, essential core of our identity. And then they say, oh, look, um, Buddhism has from the very beginning said that if you look for an independent essential self, you won't find anything. You will only find things that are no self or non-self that mm -hmm. make up the body and the mind. The point I make is that in, the, in both the neuroscientist and Buddhist context, the word self is being used in a very limited and, per, and particular way. Mm -hmm. In the Buddhism context, there's good reasons for that because what the Buddhists are trying to get us to focus on is a kind of um, feeling that we have of an inner eye that we grasp onto reflexively, um, both cognitively and emotionally, and that that grasping onto uh, a kind of um, independent inner self is actually a, a kind of deep source of our suffering and dissatisfaction. Mm. Um, and so no self there means there, there isn't such an essence, you could say. Everything is transitory and flux. And so one should um, not identify with transitory and influx things as if they were 
an essential and fixed self because that's just inevitably going to be um, going to create distress and anxiety and suffering. In the neuroscience context, though, um, it's coming out of a history of discussion in you know in Western philosophy and science where the idea is that if there were some kind of real self, it would either have to be a non-physical soul um, or it would have to be something in the brain that we could find. And the point to be made in that context is, well, how we use the word self has evolved way beyond that particular conception mm -hmm. so that in a scientific context, when we talk about self, most of the time we're interested in a person's sense of being a self, of being uh, an individual, how that is shaped and em emerges developmentally and socially and, um, and so on as a result of biological, social, cultural processes. And so in that perspective, it's not that there's no self, it's that there is a self, it's a, it's a developmental social construction it actually plays important, you know, roles. It's what enables us to have, you know, autobiographical memory and planning for the future. And it's not an illusion. It, it's not an independently existing thing, but it's not an illusion. It's it's actually a it's a construction that has a kind of functional role to play. In the Buddhist context, the idea that uh, there is no self is that there's no kind of essence or core. But Buddhists also acknowledge that there is a sense of um, personhood, you could say, that has to do with society and history and, mm -hmm. um, and so on that, that's important. And so one of the points I make in the chapter is that this, this kind of collapsing of the Buddhism and the science into the uh, simplistic statement that there is no self, the self is an illusion, works with a kind of uh, faulty, uh, limited concept of, of self as an independent, substantial thing that isn't how we should limit our thinking to the to the notion mm -hmm. of self. You have a great quote, if I could read it, that might, I just thought this explained it really well. The self is an ongoing process that enacts an I, and in which the I is no different from the process itself, rather like the way dancing is a process that enacts a dance, and in which the dance is no different from the dancing. And it goes on, just as it's misguided to think that a dance is inside the muscles of a dancer, instead of being an expression of the whole body in dynamic interrelation with the world and other dancers, so it's misguided to think that we could find a self inside the brain. Yeah, so that's very much the idea that, as in the case of, of, a, of a dance, the dance is in the dancing. And so in the case of the self, the self is in the selfing. It's, it's, <laughs> right. And, you know, there are good and bad ways to do that in ways yeah. that are you know, um, better and worse individually and socially. And, you know, for me, the, the, the question should be about, um, you know, what kinds of selves do we want to construct? Mm -hmm. and, and not that's, I don't think that's well addressed by saying, especially in a kind of what I would call neural Buddhist discourse, that there is no self. And mm -hmm. neuroscience has shown that, you know, Buddhism is right, that there is no self. Mm -hmm. um, and my alternative is, is to say that certainly from the scientific perspective, the idea that you could show there is no self by going in and trying to find a self in the brain is just that's the wrong place to look. Mm -hmm. um, that's like, again, like trying to find the dance inside the muscles of the dancer. That's like, mm -hmm. that's not where the dance is. Right. Um, the self is, is something relational that has to do with the interaction with the environment. Now, in the Buddhist context, the story is more complicated because the Buddhist view, um, I mean, the Buddhist view gets articulated in different ways over centuries and millennia in dialogue with other, you know, other traditions where they, where they argue back and forth about this. Um, but the Buddhist stance is very much one about um, disidentifying with changing elements of the body and mind as self, where self means this kind of essence. Mm -hmm. And that might or might not be an appropriate thing to do, depending on what one's aims and aspirations are, what one's, you know, value system is, but that can't be immediately sort of just grafted onto the scientific context because mm -hmm. it confuses really what are sort of ethical or in a Buddhist context, we would say soteriological issues, issues concerned with liberation, with salvation, which mm -hmm. have to do with norms and ethics. You can't just kind of graft those onto a scientific discourse, which is um, not 
shaped or driven by those kinds of norms and um, soteriological concerns. And a simpler way to put this, and this is a theme throughout the book, is to say that, um, and this connects to to um, issues about Buddhist modernism and what I call Buddhist exceptionalism, is that there is this idea that oh, Buddhism isn't really a religion; it's a science of the mind, or it's mm-hmm. a therapy, or it's a philosophy, or it's a way of life. And then um, to say, look, science validates this philosophy or therapy or way of life or mind science um, because it shows that there is no self. And that's what Buddhism says. Mm -hmm. And one of the themes throughout the book that I I argue, again, this is not news to many people, Mm -hmm. is that no, Buddhism is fundamentally a religion. It's Mm -hmm. it's fundamentally about um, human liberation, human transformation, according to the ultimate norm of awakening or nirvana or liberation that's not a scientific idea that can't be scientifically validated or for that matter scientifically invalidated because it's just in a different universe of discourse mm-hmm. it's it's an analogy would be you know the 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 norm of of the sublime or the beautiful in art that's not mm-hmm. something science can validate or invalidate it's it's a norm that depends on the practice of the artistic community, what it values, what it sees as sublime or beautiful. And that's always up for negotiation. That's always being challenged within the tradition. It's always undergoing transformation. And nirvana is analogous to that. It's not the same, but it's analogous to that. So the idea that you could render, you know, Buddhism into a scientific discourse and then use Western science to establish it is, I think, um, just fundamentally uh, mis- misbegotten. And mm-hmm. again, this is not a point that's original to me. Many, you know, many scholars of Buddhist modernism and of, and of Buddhism make this point. Um, but what I try to do is to use their work, especially by bringing it to bear on the discussion between science and Buddhism that's right. you know, emerged in the context of, of um, Buddhism and the mind sciences, Western mind sciences. Yeah, through, throughout the book, you raise... Um in a way that I think is really important, ideas that are often engaged in this dialogue between Buddhism and science um, that you say are really not the domain of science. They're they're just not scientific concepts, um, as you were just discussing with ethical or aesthetics or even the self in, in the ways that you were describing it. So I guess that leads me to ask, what do you think the domain of science is in this conversation? So when you say science in this conversation, what, how are you thinking about this conversation? Just <laughs> just because there's different ways of rendering oh, that. Yeah, I guess uh, I guess I kind of mean writ large the conversation between Buddhism and science, mm-hmm. okay. um, and as you know, contemplative research as you know as a, yeah. a field, if you want to call it that, ha- has emerged or evolved. Right. Um, so there, I really do think think it depends on what it is that we are trying to do. Um, so if what we're interested in, as ma- as many people are today, is looking at the effects of Buddhist meditation practices on the brain and behavior, then there's good ways and bad ways of asking that question. Mm-hmm. Good ways bring in perspectives of you know history and anthropology and not just neuroscience. And that question should not be seen as in principle any different from the question, what are the effects of Christian prayer on brain and behavior? Mm-hmm. What are the effects of Muslim prayer on brain and behavior? Um, that is, we're, we're, we're looking at um, social ritualistic practices that are transformative for the people who participate in them. Um, But there's nothing to my mind that should be made special about Buddhism in that setting. Even though I think many people would argue that the practices of meditation are somewhat different than prayer, although maybe you would disagree in terms of, as it's often referred to as like mind training or, you know, these attentional capacities or intentionally training things like compassion or things like that. Do you see any difference there or is it really a similar process? I mean, I think there are definitely differences conceptually and procedurally Mm -hmm. um, between, say, mindfulness of breathing Mm 
and centering prayer, which is already influenced, I suppose, by by Asian contemplative practices, or mm-hmm. or maybe you know more classical kind of exercises in the Catholic tradition. There there are of course differences, but what I would now be very suspicious of is the idea that those differences have to do in the one case with one of them training the mind and the other not training the mind. Mm, they both mm-hmm. train the mind, but they, you know, the, the trainings may be different. They may, mm. they may overlap in some ways and they may mm-hmm. be different. So they both train the mind and they both train the mind according to conceptual systems. Mm-hmm. And those conceptual systems are ethical and normative and are not directly validatable or invalidatable that's mm-hmm. a verb <laughs> by um, <laughs> by science. So that's how I would how I would look at it gotcha. now. Um, so what that means is that, and this is where I would love to have the conversation with Varela, is I no longer see the Buddhist meditation practice as having a privileged status for revealing the way the mind fundamentally is in itself. Mm. So the rhetoric around the convergence of science and Buddhism is a rhetoric of understanding the fundamental nature of the mind. Mm -hmm. And for scientists, that usually means being able to understand human cognition in a way that, you know, relates it to the brain. And for Buddhists, um, that means something like, uh, well, depending on the Buddhist tradition, it can mean something like, you know, disclosing the fundamental nature of consciousness or the fundamental nature of awareness or um, having a accurate conceptual map and meditative discernment of the, you know, the elements, the mental elements that make up the sort of changing flux of patterns of mental activity, the dharmas as they're called in Abhidharma. Mm -hmm. Um, So the rhetoric is about revealing the nature of the mind. So that rhetoric is one that I I now am really quite skeptical of. Mm. I think that... um, yeah, what do you think it's doing instead? I mean, what I would say is that it's, as I said before, is that the the meditative practices are creating as much as they're disclosing, mm-hmm. and they're doing it according to social rituals and practices and conceptual theoretical systems. Mm-hmm. And I don't see that as fundamentally different from what happens in a Christian community or a Muslim community. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's like one question if we're asking about, <laughs> you know, um, this conversation where that means sort of looking at the study of meditation. If, however, the question is something like, what is the nature of mind? Um, then I would say that the relevant dialogue partner is not Buddhist meditation as a sort mm-hmm. of object of study, the relevant dialogue partner is Buddhist philosophy mm-hmm. and the and the rich tradition of you know Indian and Tibetan and Chinese philosophical theorizing and writing about the mind, which is very deep and mm-hmm. in philosophical terms, you know, very uh, analytically precise and profound with all sorts of interesting discussions and analyses and kind of conceptual maps. But there I would say, it, it's distinct and, spe- and special for being distinct, but there are other traditions that are equally distinct and special that come out of Islamic philosophy or Christian philosophy and Western philosophy that's shaped you know, by a, a Jewish, Christian, Islamic mm-hmm. heritage. And that's all in the domain of philosophy, which can collaborate mm-hmm. very productively with science. Yeah. But, but Buddhism isn't special in that regard. And, mm. and there I actually think, and this is a theme in the book that pops up now and then, is that we actually need to see Buddhist philosophy as embedded in its historical cultural context of dialogue with Brahminical and Jain traditions. And, and the, the fundamental, for me, lasting value comes out of the debates across those traditions. It's not things mm-hmm. that are found in any one tradition sort of decoupled from the other because the insights emerge because all these traditions are conversing with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and and a much of that conversation is very relevant to cognitive science and philosophy of mind. That's a great call for the expansion of the work in contemplative research to include the, these other philosophies. I think yeah. There's been an intention to do that, but I think to date it's really focused primarily on on Buddhist philosophy when it has engaged with philosophy. Yeah, I mean, I think the reason for that, I mean, this is something I've thought a lot about um, 
you know, over many years of being involved in the Mind and Life Summer Institute, going back to like to the early years when I when I helped first design the institute, and then many years when I was faculty and and mm-hmm. and a participant, um, I very much was of the view that the reason Buddhism is so important in this dialogue is because Buddhism actually is different. Mm. It's pursuing meditation as a kind of inner science of the mind, and that's mm-hmm. why it works for for the dialogue with scientists. Mm-hmm. Um, and I now fundamentally think that's wrong. <laughs> um, it's like, this has been a shift in my thinking wow. and, and um, it's something that has evolved through conversations with many, many people, um, particularly people in Buddhist studies and, and religious studies. And the way that I think about it now is that, no, the reason why we think that the dialogue works there and is special there is because we're caught up in this rhetoric that Buddhist meditation is a science. And we Mm -hmm. actually don't see that it's a theoretical, normative, and religious system that has crafted itself in modern times to be appealing to scientists. Mm -hmm. But scratch a little deeper, and it it isn't the case that one is studying a kind of inner science of the mind that one wouldn't be doing if one was looking at Christian prayer. Scratch a little deeper, what you've got is you've got a conceptual system and you've got social ritual forms of, um, of performance and practice that structure the mind and create um, communities and individuals to be a certain way. And, and that's what we see in other cases as well. So if we reshaped how we thought about what we're studying, then it would be immediately obvious that, you know, Christian traditions, Islamic traditions should equally be part of the discussion. It's because mm-hmm. it, it's not that Buddhism is special, it's that we're thinking about things in the wrong way and we make it out as if Buddhism is special. And then we keep going down that road blind to hmm. actually how we need to reconfigure things so that we could actually have a much richer uh, sense of what what it is we're studying that would include other traditions, and you know, I should say by other traditions, you know, I, I've mentioned like Christianity and Islam, and I don't mean just you know those. I, I mentioned those because you know they're often seen as the problematic ones in this dialogue. Mm-hmm. But you know, there there are um, there are uh, many different indigenous um, traditions, Native American traditions um, that all have their own kinds of socially collective ritualistic transformative practices that would be um, important to include in the discussion if if there are individuals from those traditions who want to participate in that kind of discussion. I mean, maybe maybe some don't and that's fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of how I see it now. Yeah. I have to say, I really appreciate it. I've always appreciated your, you bring a critical perspective always, which I think is essential. Um, but you equally critique yourself yeah. and your own previous views, which is right, really refreshing. Right. Yeah, Thompson <laughs> 3.0, I hope. <laughs> yeah. In your book, you argue for a position of what you call cosmopolitanism. Yeah. Um, is that kind of what you were describing with all of these different views at the table? Yeah. So cosmopolitanism is a, is a term that philosophers use to refer to the idea that um, human beings are all part of one community, but there are different traditions with different value systems, um, different philosophies, different ethics. And it's important to acknowledge and respect those differences, to care about the welfare of the individuals who make up those different communities, and to engage in conversation across communities, not with the aim necessarily of of consensus, but of um, simply getting to know each other and allowing oneself to be changed through getting to know somebody else. And so that's how I think about Buddhism, certainly historically in South Asia, that it was part of a rich cosmopolitan context where Sanskrit was the language of learning and Buddhist philosophers and Buddhist religious teachers were engaged with with um, Brahminical and Jain 
uh, philosophers and religious teachers, and they mutually shaped each other's thought and practice. And out of that, especially in context with, uh, with science and philosophy today, we have the possibility for a kind of cross-cultural investigation, where if we're thinking specifically about the invest, uh, investigating the mind, the idea is that the, the language and, and concepts of any one tradition shouldn't be assumed to be the default for understanding how the human mind is and that we, that we need a, um, uh, a, a cosmopolitan discussion and, and context. And that is very much in keeping with the original, I think, vision of um, the mind and life dialogues where mm-hmm. the two particular partners in the conversation were, you know, Tibetan Buddhism as represented by the Dalai Lama and Western mind and brain scientists. Mm-hmm. Um, so I see that as a, as a kind of microcosm of a larger cosmopolitan mm-hmm. discussion that could be had. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Um, we've talked a little bit about about Varela and your wish to have uh, these conversations with him now, what do you what do you imagine he would think of you know how this field has exploded in many ways and being taken up in popular culture and mindfulness hype and all of that? Well, there I think he would actually not be too happy. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, he, but also, yeah, I guess in both ways. Yeah, that as um, well as the way the the field has evolved. Yeah, I mean, in terms of how the field has evolved. Um, I mean, he would be very encouraged by some things. Uh, I think the idea that um, we can talk about uh, meditation and philosophy informed by meditation and different um, different conceptual systems from different traditions. I, th- it, it, you know, that that we can do that today in a way that was impossible. Mm. or very difficult when he was working, I think he would be very, you know, he'd be thrilled yeah. by that. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, for for him, the as I said before, the driving question wasn't, um, it wasn't about validating meditation, proving that meditation is beneficial. Um, it was It was really about a more fundamental investigation into the nature of cognition and the nature of awareness and consciousness. Uh, I think he would be uh, disappointed that that hasn't been taken up more. Mm -hmm. I think at the same time, he would, uh, I'm trying to think of the right way to put this exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was, he was very, um, he wasn't North American. He wasn't from the, you know, he wasn't from the United States. He was Mm -hmm. from, he was from Latin America. He was from Chile and he had a, he had a very different, you know, he felt himself in many ways as an outsider to the West and was very critical of the the Western kind of individualistic, capitalistic mm. discourse. I think he'd be very discouraged by the way that that a, that a lot of of the work, um, certainly around mindfulness, has been completely swallowed up in that. Mm-hmm. So he would, yeah, he would he would be very critical of that. The whole way that a lot of the discourse has gotten framed around well being and happiness, I don't mm-hmm. think he would. He would agree with that. I think. Um, I think for him, concepts like happiness and well-being are ones that are are very strongly shaped by social and cultural and political agendas and structures. And so, the idea that you could sort of extract those and investigate them in terms of um, measures of emotion regulation at an at an individual level in in an embedded structure that's profoundly exploitative and unjust uh, Mm -hmm. that he would be extremely critical of Mm -hmm. um so it would be nice if he were still around so that this would discussion could happen right yeah yeah i imagine he would also be really instrumental in continuing to to try to shape the field yeah i mean the other thing i would say about him you know he's he was he's a complicated person and had many facets as we all do and so um, how he would have evolved through all of this is, you know, would be really, and it, right. is, it would be interesting, like how he would have evolved and how his evolution would have changed it and made it different from what it is. I mean, these are things I, I think about a lot. Mm. Um, he was very much, uh, and part of it is just the times in which he was working. He was very much caught up in this kind of Buddhist exceptionalism that I criticize in the book. Mm-hmm. So how that would have evolved for him, whether it would have evolved, that is something that I uh, would be really yeah. to, to know. I'm not, I'm not sure what the answer to that is actually. I mean, I had already had arguments with him about some aspects of this, you know, mm-hmm. back in the days when we were writing. So mm-hmm. I don't know. Interesting. 
I think the last thing I would love to just get your perspective on is really big picture stepping back, thinking about our society today and a lot of the difficulties and struggles that we're facing on many individual, societal, cultural, planetary <laughs> scales. Yeah. Um, what is the value of this engagement and trying to understand the mind from your perspective? Kind of like, what can that bring to the picture? Um, yeah, I mean, I think if if we investigate the mind in a way that's really let's say nuanced and sensitive to these dimensions of embodiment and embeddedness, then I think it enables us to envision um, possibilities for transformation that we really need in order to, you know, as we, as we enter into what increasingly people like to call the Anthropocene, which is the, the, you know, geological epoch of human activity that actually transforms the planet in profound, you know, environmental ways. And we need to find our way through that in some way that's going to make human life viable on the planet. I, I don't think that that's going to be possible without a deeper understanding of the mind. Hmm. And especially the, the way that the mind is embodied and embedded and and inactive and in all the ways that we you know we're talking about previously that i mean just, just to take simple examples that that what sort of is salient for us attentionally has to do with how we're structured so that we s are biased to selectively attend to some things and ignore and exclude other things and how those biases are created at all different kinds of levels developmentally historically socially culturally biologically you know, without a better understanding of that, you know, our chances for getting out of the kind of um, dysfunctional capitalism that we're in seem to me to be pretty small. Mm. Um, so th that for me is kind of the, the big motivation really is, um, you know, how are we going to find our way forward? And, and this was actually, you know, very much the motivation of Francisco and the motivation that lay behind the creating of the Lindisfarne Association to go mm -hmm. back to, you know, where all this started was unless we have a, a, a deeper understanding, systemic understanding of the human mind and its relationship to the environment, then we're not going to be able to find our way out of the, this, this kind of capitalist uh, structure that we've created for ourselves that mm -hmm. now is, you know, is on the verge of collapse and is not, is not functional. So that, that I think is, fundamentally what's at stake. Well, thank you so much. You've been really generous with your time and I really appreciate you chatting. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. And uh, I also just want to personally thank you. Your work and you as a person has have been a great teacher to me over the years. So. Thanks. Well, I've learned a lot from you too. And we've been working together for maybe not so much in the past few years, but over a number of years. So yeah. Yeah, it's been a joy. So thanks so much for joining us today. And I look forward to future conversations. Yeah, me too. Thank you. This episode was edited and produced by me and Phil Walker. Music on the show is from Blue Dot Sessions and Universal. Show notes and resources for this and other episodes can be found at podcast.mindandlife.org. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on iTunes and share it with a friend. If something in this conversation sparked insight for you, we'd love to know about it. You can send an email or voice memo to podcast at mindandlife.org. Mind and Life is a production of the Mind and Life Institute. Visit us at mindandlife.org, where you can learn more about how we bridge science and contemplative wisdom to foster insight and inspire action towards flourishing. There, you can also support our work, including this podcast.